Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Journeys Today. We're coming to you live from our studios in Kokum Lemli. We're on DTT because we're free to air. On DSTV channel 421 and Go TV channel 425, we are a home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. Coming up this afternoon, leading member of the Movement for Change, Hope Sanadoye, charged with publication of false news over his claim that he engaged the services of some five persons to detonate dynamite in the Volta region during the 2016 general elections. Oh, I'm talking to my lawyer, please. I'm talking to my lawyer. Ah, what is this? Wait, wait. Pastor, wait, wait. 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 Wait, This afternoon, KPMG report reveals the revenue assurances contract given to SML by the Ghana Revenue Authority for the upstream petroleum and minerals audit was without a needs assessment. There is more as anti-corruption campaigners call for its cancellation. Plus, Ghana faces oil depletion in 15 years if production decline persists. Third of 10, and about a quarter of SGN, Sankofa Jinami. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't add to our reserves, in a matter of 10 to 15 years, we will have no oil industry. more as Pierre warns Ghana gas could suffer a major hit operationally if its $600 million indebtedness to GMPC is not addressed immediately. My name is Aisha Prime. We're also live on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram and Xspaces at Joy News on TV. Please do stay for details. <laughs> A leading member of the Movement for Change, Hope Sanadoya, has been charged with publication of false news over his claim that he engaged the services of some five persons to detonate dynamite in the Volta region during the 2016 elections. Mr. Adoya has since been granted a 220,000 bill by a Dansman Circuit Court where he was arraigned Thursday morning. Latif Idris was there at the Dancewoman Court for us. He joins me with more Latif Idris. What more can you report from the court? Latif Idris, uh, you are the Dancewoman Circuit Court for this case. What can you report from there? So we can report that uh, Hope Sinadoye has been granted a bill of 20,000 Ghana cities uh, with two sureties, uh, one of them to be justified. As we speak, Aisha, uh, Hope Sinadoye, together with his legal team, are currently at the ministry's police station where he was arrested and detained overnight. And they are currently working against time to conclude the bail conditions so that Mr. Adoya will not spend yet another day and night in the cooler, if you like. So that is the current situation we have on our hands now, that Mr. Adoya and his legal representation are currently at the poli ministry's police station trying to execute the bill that has been granted by the circuit court here in Dansuman. One other critical information or significant information we have taken on the ground which will bring viewers details about in the coming hours is that uh, the prosecution and the entire team of the prosecution, some of them are currently trying to evaluate the property of that uh, member of the sureties whose property has to be justified. That property, we understand, is being evaluated by the prosecution and 
to ascertain whether or not it qualifies Mr. Doye to secure the bail that uh, is currently sitting in this court, which they are trying to prosecute at the ministry's police station. That is currently the situation. And let me run us through quickly the argument in court today. Uh, Mr. Doye's uh, legal representation made the argument that Mr. Hobson Adoye is a public figure, well-known, good character. He has never been charged of any offense that has been uh, taking him into jail. So the court should, based on that, grant him bail. He also made the argument that, uh, and made reference to Martin Pebu and the Attorney General 2015-2016, that all offenses are bailable. Uh, prosecution, on the other hand, refuted. They argued that this is based and hinges on national security, if you like, because of the publication of false news, as has been, uh, Mr. Adoy has been charged with. Uh, listening to both arguments, the judge concluded that she's granting the bill with the conditions that I've listed above. And so the case has been adjourned to June the 26th of this year. Uh, but we have to wait till the end of day to make sure that uh, Mr. Adoy and his legal representation have been able to meet the bill conditions that have been set by the court, Aisha. That's if it drees with that update from the Dansoman Circuit Court. Of course, earlier we spoke with a leading a uh, senior member of Alan Tremontin's Movement for Change, Nano Heninto. Listen as he gives us a rundown of what the movement intends to do about the case. Well, as we speak right now, he was processed for court by the police. Uh, so he was taken to the Dansuman Circuit Court. The case has been heard and he's just been granted bail. So our lawyers are going with him, together with the police, back to the ministry's police station to complete the bail procedures. My information is that the charge was publication of false news. That was the charge on which he is being tried. Thank you. The Wahai Court, the Wahai Court presided over by Justice Yusuf Asibe has adjourned to June 12. The case of the three persons accused of murdering the owner of Royal Cozy Hills Hotel. The adjournment followed a letter presented to the court by the lawyer of the first accused, Clement Elidi, reportedly from the Chief Justice to the War District Court, directing that the case be transferred to Kumasi. The supervising Wa High Court Judge Justice Yusuf Asibe ruled for the adjournment pending further verification and instruction from the Chief Justice. Eric Johnson was allegedly gruesomely murdered at his private residence in Jurapa on February 10 this year. Join us as upper West Regional Correspondent Rafiq Salam has more. The former War District Council for Office, 10 Wa High Court, was full to the rafters. The spectators came early to hear the start of the trial of three persons accused of killing 62-year-old owner of the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, Eric Johnson. The three accused persons, former human resource manager of the Royal Cozy Hills Hotel, Elisa Fonyiche Mahama, Fondex officer Belinda Miller, and security guard Kweku Kombata started at the War District Court in February following their arrest over the alleged murder of the Jiropa Dubai owner at his private residence in February. The trio were remanded into police and prison custody to enable the prosecution to wrap up their investigations. The case was therefore transferred to the Wai Court for the trial to begin. They were indicted two weeks ago and the Jiro panel for the trial impaneled and the trial slated for today. Said Abdul Shakur is the principal state attorney and leading the prosecution. A letter to the court and to us. 
saying that the case, the CJ has asked that this case be transferred to Kumasi. But I, and so he wanted the court to order for it to be transferred, and I argued that that was not right, and that there was no letter from the CJ to the court, because we are not dealing with the High Court. The letter that was shown to us was addressed to a district court, and the instructions were that after indictment, the case should be sent to Kumasi. But at the time that we saw this letter, we had already put it before High Court, and we had empaneled, and we were about to commence trial, and we had actually prayed the court to let us have a daily trial of the case, so that we, we expect that at least by July we should have been done and over with this case. And then the counsel then showed the letter. He added that more than half of the witnesses that the prosecution will rely on to prove their case are resident in the region, arguing that the best place for the trial is where witnesses are all within our province of six are in Japa, one is in Wa. The only three that are not available are all professional policemen that we will be calling from Accra. So we think that the proper place to do this case should be the Wa High Court. I don't think why, I don't see why anybody should be forum shopping for a matter that is not, nobody is under siege, nobody, nobody is being threatened, nothing is happening. They have, all of them have lawyers and the lawyers are in court and we are about to start this matter. So we feel a little bit unsettled with what happened today, but we are all waiting for, I will have to refer the matter to my superiors in Accra to, to, to see what next we are supposed to do. Justice Asibe adjourned the case to June 12, 2024, pending verification and further instructions from the Chief Justice. Close family members and some indigents who were at the court were unhappy about the decision and called on the Chief Justice to rescind the decision. The question we are asking is that what is the content of the said petition that generated the result from the Chief Justice? Because it means a petition was sent as stated in court that the A1, his mother was the one who uh, wrote the petition. So that means if we also raise a, a petition here to the Chief Justice that this is the jurisdiction in which the, the, the murder took place, is it going to also warrant a reversal of the matter? Because it means the person who generated the petition to the Chief Justice has an interest in the matter. We also have an interest in the matter. The whole Upper West Region has an interest in the matter. The state has an interest in the matter. So are you going to just sit down and just consider one petition, one letter written by a mother to, uh, what is the court, to the Chief Justice, and the case has been transferred. And now we are also asking that, are you saying that we here, for example, the indigenous people here, we should be able to transport ourselves to Kumasi every single time to go and listen to the case? I cannot accuse them or no, we don't have that, but we think that it should be here so that we can also have access. We can come and also listen to what happens there, so that we will see the end of what happens in Jericho, whatever will happen to whoever is involved, whoever will be going for culpable. But it is down there, we can't go really there, even from Jericho, tell me, it's a good number of people, they have been coming in the bus, and every day they come, see that only a few of us came around, I'm here, but these are from Jericho. Reporting for Dwayne News, Rafik Salam. Wow. Let's stick with legal matters and head to the Supreme Court now because the Apex Court has ordered for a substituted service on MP for Tolon Habib Idrisu. After several failed attempts to affect court processes on him, Roger JMV is invoking the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to interpret and enforce the provisions of the 1992 constitution relating to the qualification of the MP. I've been joined by Head of Legal Affairs, Des Kujo Nyakon, who will be telling us more on this. Kujo Nyakon, why is the court given this order? Is the MP not in the country? Well, so I shall be judging if you follow the writ at the Supreme Court invoking its original jurisdiction, including statement of case and cause them to be served on all the defendants. So if you look at the defendants, uh, they include the Tolan MP, Habib Idris, to the Electoral Commission and the Attorney General. So the available records at the registry of the court indicate that the EC and the AG have been served, but service on the MP has not been successful. And ever since the processes were filed, the plaintiff told the court that he's not rested in making all efforts at ensuring that the MP who is the first defendant in this case is served, but to no avail. So consequent to all of these developments, 
the registry of the courts officially wrote to him on their inability to serve the MP. In fact, because he is an MP, apart from attempting personal service, um, there was also service on the clerk of parliament um, for, for the MP to be served, but also that did not also um, um, go through. So according to the court registry, a motion ex parte for an order of court for substitute service was filed and has been duly granted by the court. So it's been almost two years of trying to effect the service on the MP and per the order so granted by the court. This paves way for copies of uh, this uh, service to be pasted on notice board of the Supreme Court. Uh, service uh, copies will also be pasted on the clerk of parliament on the notice board of the parliament. And then uh, copies will also be put on the notice board of the high court. And so that is it, it with the service there. the background to this story? I mean, the facts of the story. Well, so Aisha, uh, it was a red file at the APS court on the 7th of November 2022 by Bujaj Jemfi. He argues that the MP was allegedly convicted of fraud in Australia prior to the 2020 election and therefore was not qualified to be a legislator per Article 94 2C of the 1992 Constitution. And so that is the matter before the Supreme Court. That's Kujanya Kung with those updates uh, on the uh, Deputy Whip's um, case in the Supreme Court. There's more we'll be bringing your way in our subsequent bulletins as and when we get the updates. Let's move on to other stories. Lawyer and anti-corruption campaigner Martin Pibu says seeking parliamentary approval for the SML GRE deal as recommended by KPMG is not the solution to the problem at hand. Auditing firm KPMG revealed in its report on the controversial revenue assurance contract between the GRE and the SML that the contract for the upstream petroleum and minerals audit did not have the needs assessment backing the contract in the first place. It also says the contract did not meet existing legal requirements as it did not receive parliamentary approval. The president released the KPMG report weeks after a section of Ghanaians, including civil society, insisted the many infractions in the contract demanded that the full report be made to the public. My colleague Kukwa Sante has been sharing some details on that. We know that the Media Foundation for West Africa, which fought Estate, organized this investigation wrote an RTI request to the presidency demanding the release of the report. The president at the time cited some exemptions under the RTI law and declined to provide that. Later or subsequent to this, the presidency indicated that the president, in the interest of transparency, will be releasing this report, and that report has been released since yesterday. And if you look at some of the key findings in it, like you said, the needs-based assessment. For a state organization to spend billions and millions of cities on a project, there must first be the needs assessment. That is, do we need this or are other state agencies already doing this? According to this full KPMG report, that was not done. It appears some persons at GRA just decided that because of certain key fluctuations in the system, they wanted this deal without any needs-based assessment. And if you go through the report, let me take you to page 14, where it talks about GRA breaching Act 663 for engaging SML without PPE approval. We know that initially, SML was called SMEL, and when GRE wanted to enter this contract with SML, they went to the PPA board three times. PPA declined on all these three occasions to give approval because they said SML did not have the track record and the capacity to engage in that multi-billion multi -billion city agreement. So GRE decided to find a way to beat this system. They subletted this contract to um, um, SML under the, an, an, an originating um, originating contract in the system and then when West Blue left the system then they just gave them the contract still without PPA approval and that is it containing this full KPMG report that has since been published Aisha. Lawyer Martin Pueblo says the KPMG report actually confirms the fears 
Lawyer Martin Pebo says the KPMG report actually confirms the fears of Ghanaians that the deal is shortchanging the country, adding the only way to rest the deal is for the deal to uh, is for the contracts to be cancelled. Because I've seen parts of the reports, the ones that are showing that SML didn't deliver. So we need to now quantify how much we lost and to hold Oforiata and the other persons involved for this uh, loss. And also, let's not forget, we need to terminate. We need to terminate this agreement because, you see, Aisha, you know it very well. In law, when an agreement is void, no. The Supreme Court has made it clear that when an agreement like that is void, public agencies shouldn't pay money because if the Supreme Court, and I'm talking about the uh, Martin Amidu versus Waterville and Wyoming, et etc., Isofutun and all those companies, because the Supreme Court is saying that, hey, if they don't put in that policy, public officers can collude and enter into illegal contracts and pay, and then say, oh, but the people have worked. So let's go a bit uh, further to explain. So under general contract law, sometimes an agreement can be void. But once you've worked, you'll be paid for, because it's unfair to say that somebody has worked, but just because the paperwork is not good, then you say he sh you want to take the work for free. The locus classicus on this subject is the case of uh, City and Country Waste Limited versus uh, Attorney J uh, AMA. That is this man, uh, the NDC financier, Eddie Annan. So Eddie Annan's company did some uh, uh, this, uh, waste uh, collection and disposal, like what Zoom Lion did. Long story short, the agreements were void. The Supreme Court said, oh, they've worked, waste collection, blah, blah, they'll pay. And so we'll pay. And then the Supreme Court said in that case that they will deal with such illegal contracts case by case basis. Fast, fast forward from city and country waste, you come to uh, this uh, uh, Matna Nidu versus uh, Waterville, Wyoming, and then the Isofutone cases. And the Supreme Court is saying that, hey, listen, if we keep saying, if somebody is wet, let's pay, let's pay. Then what the public officers will do is they'll just get together and do the illegal thing, knowing that, oh, even if you talk, you will say, but the person has worked, pay. So in the uh, Wyoming case, you see that the Supreme Court ordered a recovery of the money. So in the same way, in this SML case, we should cancel it and order a recovery of the money. That's what we should do. Ophoria knew this. We have to hold this man responsible. I don't know why we just sat down as a country and allowed the Kufuado and his brother to just run this country at ground. They'll put their hands in every deal to just make their family rich. I mean, this is not Satan. Everyone join us today. Now, co-chair of the Ghana Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, Dr. Steve Manteo, says Ghana's oil fields are peaking, leading to a decline in crude oil production. The country is said to have reduced half of Jubilee fields, a third of 10, and about a tenth of Sankofa Jinyame. Dr. Manteo says if we don't add to our reserves, in a matter of 10 to 15 years, we will have no oil industry. His warning follows a PIAC report indicating that crude oil production in Ghana declined for the fourth consecutive year in 2023. There are two main reasons. One, operational issues. Jubilee started production in November, December 2010. And it is... 12, 13 years in, into its, its production life. It's projected that Jubilee, Jubilee has a lifespan of, say, 25. Yes, it used to be 30 years. Now it's about 25 years. Now it's more like halfway through its production life. So you naturally uh, expect that Jubilee will decline because reservoir pressure is, is, is de de being depleted. So they have to kind of adopt artificial measures, either gas injection, water injection, and, and the likes, to bring on stream uh, more oil. 
10 is basically, it started just recently, 10 is basically technical challenges. In fact, in 2023, the operators that Talu actually reported to PIA that basically is due to technical challenges which they are working around the clock to uh, address. Now, Sankofa Jinyami is predominantly a gas field. Oil is associated with the gas. So you produce more gas than oil. So it is usually expected that production, oil production from Sankofa Jinyami will be lower than 10 and Jubilee. So that is the operational challenges. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the regulatory, more or less, than, and the governance challenges, um, it looks like we've not learned much lessons from the first licensing round. PIA, in collaboration with uh, CSOs in the space, actually brought out a paper uh, after monitoring the whole process that there are one or two issues that led to the unsuccessful uh, nature of the bidding rounds. One was that the data we presented was of low quality data, 2D data, where industry players, if they acquire that data, they have to spend extra money to process that data, bring it up to either 3D or 4D. Mm. So they shied away from that. The second one was that the sizes of blocks offered Despite the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation's efforts to attract investors, nothing substantial has materialized, adding if we had bigger blocks, GNPC would have a better prospect of finding oil in the right quantities that will get them value for money. The trend actually speaks to two things. First is that our oil fields are peaking. And as uh, Mark Ajiman indicated, um, the last time I checked, uh, we've actually produced about half of Jubilee. Mm. We've done about a third of 10, and about a quarter of SGN, Sankofa Jinami. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't add to our reserves, in a matter of 10 to 15 years, we will have no oil industry. I know GMPC has been making um, efforts at attracting investments into our oil industry. But the investments have not been forthcoming. Sometimes I feel we are even just throwing money down the drain. They are not coming. The investments are not coming for obvious reasons. Um, first, we had ExxonMobil that exited our oil industry and their main reason was the sizes of our blocks and the quantum of fine they made. If we had bigger blocks, then they have better prospects of finding oil and in the right quantities. That would get them. The other reason which we infer from our last bidding round has to do with the data quality. Um, we do not have adequate data and in the right quality to be able to attract investors. This is the Ministry of Energy is aware. I recall uh, when Mohamed Amin Adam, uh, the current Minister for Finance was at the Ministry, he admitted that indeed they needed to do something about the quality of the data we have but we haven't done much about it. And so it wouldn't be the time that we'll be able to attract the right kind of investments. Then the oil companies themselves, those who are here, because for an, a new entrant, they will definitely undertake some risk analysis. And in doing so, they will be talking to the players in the country. And indeed they do talk to them. There's been a major concern about regulatory unpredictability where every year we we change the rules we introduce new fiscal items which then disrupts the financial planning of these companies in country again there's been the complaint about the application of our rules rather capriciously and so i think these are think matters that are known to the government.
the live on journey today we'll take a break when we return we'll bring you business Hi, good afternoon and welcome to the business segment on Joy News Today with me, Pius Kojo Baka. And it is the third edition of the Made in Ghana Bazaar happening live at the Accra International Conference Center. And my colleague, Michelle Ejikum, is on standby to bring us up to speed with the very latest on that. Thanks so much, yeah, Michelle. And quickly bring us up to speed what you are missing out on. very much and I'm coming to you live from the Accra International Conference Center. About just two hours ago we saw the opening ceremony of the third edition of the Made in Ghana Bazaar organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Regional uh, Integration where we had a uh, Minister for Trade and Industry also gave us a speech, but we'll bring that to you later. But of course, the ministers uh, all encouraged Ghanaians and of course the public to patronize and also to help us put the Made in Ghana goods and services onto the market, uh, the global market. And so what's happening right now is that there are a number of exhibitors here. In fact, since 9 a.m. they have been here. And let me just say this, that for the next three days, this event will be running. And so. Uh, just as the ministers encouraged the public to pass by, I'd also do the same by saying that from uh, today till Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. You can just pass by and see the exhibitions, the, I mean, the innovation, the creativity, and then the craftsmanship that uh, Ghanaians, you know, have displayed in their, with the exhibitions here. But we'll get talking to some of the exhibitors and then we get to understand what their products are and how all of these things would help us, you know, impact or boost our national economy. And so here's a stand where I see my lady in black, but I'd like you to introduce yourself to us and then you tell us a little bit more about your product. Okay, so basically this is Seco Coco Enterprise with our brand name Seco Chocolate. So we are being to buy manufacturing chocolate industry. So what we do are, um, the brands we have are um, dark chocolates, this milk with ginger. We also do for corporate customizations. So these are our generic products. The ones we have, it comes in grams. We have the 100 grams and then the 50 grams. We also have co uh, for corporate customizations. So over here, we, we work with several companies like um, MTN. We have um, Provident. And I think uh, we, we had one with um, Joy Prime. Yeah. So I like to say that uh, this event is really helping us promote our products. And so far, so, so far, so good. Right, but let me ask you this. Uh, we had our Minister for uh, Trade and Industry saying that he, he thinks that what we're doing, he's praying that it helps us, you know, to boost our national economy. How do you think your, you know, the chocolates that you are manufacturing will help us with this initiative? Okay, so basically we know uh, cocoa, uh, we are the major source of um, product, uh, our major source of uh, production is from Ghana in terms of uh, the raw materials. So with the exposure of our products, we get to experience other internationals who come here and then see our products. And by, by through this, uh, they get to know our products and then it's another form of advertisement where they get to know our products. Uh, basically that. Right. Thank you very much for speaking to us. And then let's get closer to MGL Naturals, good afternoon to you. Uh, kindly introduce yourself to us and then you tell us about your product. Okay, I'm Adam McDonald from MGL Naturals and we deal with um, organic coconut oil and shea butter. Okay, over here we have the black soup and then we have the, this is the, uh, the original shea butter, it's edible. And we also have it, shea butter, cocoa butter and then organic combination of shea butter and the cocoa butter. We also have hair food, hair products, and this is our, our hair treatment. We have castor oil, coconut oil, shampoo and conditioner. And we also have them in pouches, and in roasted, yeah. Okay, so can you tell us uh, what kind of materials or ingredients, should I say, do you use in making these? Coconut oil and then shea butter. Those are main two raw organic products that we use. So coconut oil and shea butter, yes please. All right, thank you very much. 
And let's head to the bar here. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. So I'd I'd want to know what you're selling or exhibiting, and then uh, tell us yes about about the product. Hello. Thank you very much. So this is aquatic foods, and we deal in fish products. So today we have here. This is tilapia crackers, okay. just like prawn crackers. You fry and then you 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 it pops and then it's for snacks and other things. Then we have Kobe in oil. So it's just like sardine. You can eat it with your rice shito and, and other, I mean, whatever you want to eat with. And, and then um, if you want to try it, you can ha have samples here. This one is fish, st fish sticks. It's dried fish, tilapia, and then cut fish. So uh, for the school children, it's seasoned. So for the school children, you can pour into your shito uh, when you're having your, your gari and shito and other things. And then if we move over here, I have Kobe. I have... So this is Kobe, Kobe uh, chunks. I have it, the powder, and then I have the boneless as well. So this one you pour into your stew, just like that, instead of uh, preparing, it's already prepared. And then the powder is for flavor, fapiti mukeke, because you want the flavor in your in your in your food. And then this one is the boneless. You, the bones have been taken out because uh, people complain that sometimes there's a lot of uh, bones in Kobe. So this is what we have. We have other products that we didn't bring, like fish sausages and um, fish balls and other things. But this is what we have here today. Thank All you. right. Thank you so much for speaking with us. And so these are the amazing things, the innovation, I mean, the, the innovation that Guineans have actually brought to bear and making amazing stuff. And so it's the Made in Ghana Bazaar right here at the Accra International Conference Center. And remember that it is running for three days from now till Saturday, starting every day at 9 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And so that's what's happening here. We'll bring you more details later in the next bulletin. So much, Michelle let you come for that great a comprehensive report there. And in the business segment of Journeys Today, more on myjoyonline.com forward slash business. Sports is next. Time now to bring his force here on a journey today with me, Muftao Nabila Abla, the director of foundation for the Ghana Football Association. Malcolm Apiedu says that the decision of the football governing body to initiate what they call the GFA Foundation uh, Prison Project is to ensure that inmates are reintegrated in society. You are speaking to Joyce Force. Basically, we call it the GFA Foundation Ghana Prisons Project. Is basically uh, a project where a football development initiative where we're trying to use football, the power of football, to help in the well being, the reformation, the rehabilitation, and integration of prisoners and inmates into the society. And we are doing this thing on three fronts. One, on the product front, when I say product, in terms of football logistics and equipment. And two, we're also looking at training, coaching and refereeing training. And three, is about advocacy to talk about the stigmatization as well as discrimination of prison and prisoners, basically. So we, we were receiving a lot of um, proposals, or let me say requests, from various prisons, like for football equipment and donation of jerseys and other things. And so I decided, like, let me go to the prisons and see what is happening. So I went to Insawan prisons. Insawan prisons, they have a whole league in the prisons. They play a league, a football league. But they have about nine teams in the, in the prisons. They play a league. After the end of the league, they play FA Cup and everything. They have a pitch, they have a substitution boards. I mean, they have everything that you, you, you can think of. They have a committee of sports, which plan do their scheduling, like the way we do our uh, Ghana Premier League scheduling and everything. So when I went, I saw it, and I, I thought that was a good idea. We should be able to use football to, to do so. Because you are in prison, you have a lot of time at your hands. So what you need to do is, if you don't give them some physical activity, there is boredom, there is disillusionment, there is, I mean, they will, they, they will just give up on life. So we thought that it's an initiative that we should do. And this one, uh, so that's where the planning started from, and we have brought it here. So it's taking about, about a year to do this.
That is your sports for now. We do have more sports stories on myjoyonline.com. Up next is Showbiz. Good afternoon, you're welcome to the showbiz segment with me, Jacqueline and Samar Yabwa. Now let's move straight to Nigeria. In a significant move to curb the glamorization of harmful behaviors in movies, Nigeria's National Film and Video Censors Board has mandated the Nollywood industry to eliminate depictions of smoking, criminal acts and ritual killings from films and music videos. This directive, backed by the federal government, aims to protect viewers, especially the youth, from negative influences. Some Nigerian movies over the years have been seen to glamorize harmful substances and other criminal act. In an effort to reduce this, Nigeria's National Film and Video Census Board, NFVCB, charged stakeholders in the Nollywood industry to ensure that films, music videos and other media are free from depictions and glamorization of harmful substances like smoking tobacco, criminal act, ritual killings and money rituals. Executive Director of the Board, Dr. Shaibu Husseini disclosed this at an event in Enugu yesterday. Movie producers, directors, actors and different parts of the West African countries were present at the event. According to Husseini, besides the health implications, glamorizing smoking in films poses a negative influence on teens and young adults who constitute the largest sentiment of Nigerian movie viewers. He said the film board was set to undertake detailed enlightenment programs in secondary schools, tertiary institutions, local communities and other institutions. He further added that the minister has approved the prohibition of money ritual, ritual killing, tobacco products, nicotine products promotion and glamorization display in movies, music videos and skits regulations in 2024. As the reel of regulations rolls out, Nollywood is set for a cleaner script. Well, are you ready for a trip down memory lane for Throwback Thursday? We throw a spotlight to the Sas Squad, the trailblazers of Fanta Rap who rocked the early 2000s in Takare before Nero X, Kofi Kinata and others took center stage. Takrade's music scene today boasts of stars like Nero X, Kofi Kinata, and the late Koda. But rewind to the early 2000s and you find the Sas Squad. Before Fanta Rap became mainstream, this group was setting the stage with their unique style. Back then, Christmas Eve in Takrade was all about colorful masquerades and the lively anchor stands. High life and gospel were the reigning genres embraced nationwide. But with the rise of hip life, regions across Ghana started producing standout talent. Kumase had Lord Kenya, Accra had VIP and Bookback, and Takrade had the SAS squad. The SAS squad comprising Achukoliko, Scooby Sella, on Lasty Bingo, Saint Dog, and Shoddy stood out tragically. The group's journey to Katan when on Lasty Bingo passed away. In the early 2000s, the SAS squad released their album Ahozapa Nkasa, featuring their hit song Tuma with Abre Wanana. Despite their promising start, the group faded into obscurity, leaving us with nostalgic tunes and fond memories. From certain trends to sparking dance craze, the Sa Squad's legacy is a reminder that even if the music stops, the beat goes on. For Joy News, I am Jacqueline and Samar Yaboa. On that note, it's a wrap for the showbiz segment with me, Jacqueline and Samar Yabwa. Over to you, Aisha.
Thanks so much, Jackie, for bringing us showbiz. That will be it for the bulletin this afternoon. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Log on to myjohnline.com for more of the news and updates of all the developing stories. Do enjoy the rest of our programs.